All right, uh, Commissioner Johnson, take it away. All righty, thank you, Kira. And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final expert learning series. We have three outstanding uh, folks ready to, to share the knowledge with us today. Um, I do want to send a little shout out to our folks down on the coast. Uh, hey, we're praying for you and uh, keep your head down and let's stay out of harm's way. Hopefully this thing will dissipate and we won't have that, that, that too many issues. But I uh, just wanted to let you know we're thinking about you. Um, with that, I am, uh, as we get into this, I'm going to let our guest go ahead and, and do the intro uh, themselves. Uh, everybody, we've done these a few times, so I think we know the format. And so I'm not going to I'm not going to get in the way and I'm going to kick it off and say, let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to hand it over to, to, to Ms. Frick. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, uh, let's see. We can go on to the next slide, I believe. And uh, while we do that, I'm Natalie Mims Frick. I'm with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I'm a deputy department leader and energy policy researcher there. And today I'm going to give us an overview of non-pipeline alternatives, and then I'll pass it along to my colleague expert speakers who will go into a little bit more depth on some of the topics. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, uh, gas system regulations are evolving relatively quickly um, in response to all of our changing energy system needs. And Forecasting capital projects for gas utilities is um, one of the larger challenges that are facing utilities right now, particularly as assets um, like distribution system pipelines have very long lifespans. And if we mischaracterize or over or, under, over or underestimate demand, we can have a uh, risk of an oversized or undersized system. So today I'm going to talk about non-pipeline alternatives, which are investments that defer, reduce, or avoid the need to construct or replace a pipeline. And they're an emerging cost and risk mitigation tool that gas utilities can use to reduce emissions, system costs, and potentially customer risk. Uh, the two reports that are shown on the right side of the slide are work products from Berkeley Lab and Stratagen. And they're going to be the underpinnings of my presentation today. The first one is a literature review of NPA policies from four different states. And then the second one is a framework that uh, discusses a sequential process um, for commissioners or utilities or other stakeholders to consider um, as they walk through the non-pipeline alternative analysis. So we can go on to the next slide. So for the first, I'm going to talk about the report first, where we looked at four different states. Um, the states that we looked at were New York, Rhode Island, Colorado, and California. Um, we chose those because they had established non-pipeline alternative policies. Um, and we reviewed them to identify similarities and differences in the policies. And the report has nine different aspects uh, or topics that we, we dug into. And I'm not going to go through all of them today in the interest of time, but I'll highlight, I think, four or five of them. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, I'll start off with definitions and policy purpose. So we found that there's not a commonly accepted definition of a non-pipeline alternative at this time, but that in Colorado, New York, and Rhode Island, and California, they all have pretty similar definitions. Um, and all of the states recognize that both capital expenditures and programs like efficiency or demand response are non-pipeline alternative resources. And the, the goals of an NPA um, are to remove the need for a traditional gas delivery system investment or to defer an investment or reduce the size of an investment. And on the right side for policy purpose, um, all four of the states included two policy purposes, which were reducing cost to customers and reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, from gas utilities, and they all each had other policy purposes as well, but that was one uh, commonality we found. We go on to the next slide. Another part of our review for this first report considered resource eligibility, and in Colorado, New York, and Rhode Island, 
they all allow demand side resources to participate as an MPA solution. Um, and none of the states prohibited supply side solutions from being part of an NPA portfolio, uh, which is what is shown on this table. Um, and the three states that defined resources all allowed energy efficiency as a demand side resource. We can go on to the next slide. Um, the last part that I'll talk about from this first report was is, is the benefit cost analysis and um, benefit cost analysis is a, a pretty common tool that's used to determine if the benefits of a project are greater than its costs. And generally, if you have a benefit cost analysis of greater than one, you have value. And if not, then you aren't producing value. And um, I'll just give a little bit of an overview. Uh, in Colorado, the non-pipeline alternatives are required to include direct investment costs and social costs of carbon and methane in addition to other costs. New York's benefit cost analysis framework applies to both gas and electric utilities, and it defines program costs, which include rebates, uh, utility and participant costs, and social costs. And that framework is for both non-pipeline alternatives and non-wires alternatives. And then similarly in Rhode Island, uh, the framework applies to both gas and electric investments for efficiency and non-pipeline alternative analysis. So we can go on to the next slide. I'll switch gears a little bit and start talking about the second report, which is the framework that I mentioned. And it has three major steps with several sub steps underneath each one. And I'll walk through and talk about each of the steps at a high level. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So the first step in our framework that we developed is preliminary screening. And it begins by looking at all of the proposed capital projects and then filtering out ones that are not suitable for an NPA analysis. And there's uh, sub steps in the screening process that consider the type of the project, how much the project costs, and when the system need is occurring. So currently, NPA analysis um, is focused on addressing cap capacity expansions. Um, but they can also be used to address asset replacements and new business and public improvement projects. They're not really suitable for emergency projects because uh, those are unexpected events that require immediate action. And oftentimes, non pipeline alternative solutions aren't going to be able to meet that need in that time frame. And one of the common reasons that we found that uh, MPAs wouldn't be progressed through this framework uh, was because of utility identifying that the project um, was a proposed reliability need, which oftentimes excluded um, MPAs from consideration for the solution. So we can go on to the next slide. So this is the, the second sub-step of step one. And after determining that the proposed project is suitable for the MPA analysis, um, the cost of the project is considered. And this includes the cost of the actual project, but also the cost of performing the non-pipeline alternative analysis. Um, the capital projects, we suggest that the capital projects meet a certain threshold so that the cost of doing your analysis isn't more than the actual cost of your project. Um, in the, the paper, we characterize the projects into small and large for small and large utilities based on cost and timing, which is what that table on the right side of the slide shows. Utilities need to have sufficient time to perform the non-pipeline alternative analysis and to implement the solution. And the size of the project can be an initial estimate of the time required for the non-pipeline alternative evaluation and implementation. Um, for example, small projects take um, are typically less complex, take less time, uh, less time to implement as a compared to larger projects, which might um, cover larger geographic areas or have a bigger impact on the gas system or just be more complex. We can go on to the next slide. After the utility identifies a project need and then performs its preliminary screening, the next step is to develop your non-pipeline alternative portfolio. And I'll start off by talking about eligible resources. And so, um, Resources that we found that are typically eligible are listed here. I talked about this a little bit on an earlier slide. 
efficiency, DR, electrification are the most common demand side resources. And from the supply side, um, additional and alternative fuel supplies, um, measures that temporary, temporarily reduce the gas system peak, um, including hydrogen, CNG, uh, trucking, and liquefied natural gas. And some demand side resources are better suited to meet system needs than others. Uh, we found that efficiency is best suited for capacity expansion and for minimum allowable operating pressure projects because it can reduce demand on the specific portions of the system. And for larger infrastructure projects like public improvement and pipeline replacement projects, electrification is likely um, one of the few MPAs on the demand side that can eliminate the need for investment. We can go on to the next slide. MPA portfolios can be developed through requests for proposals or through internal utility estimates. Um, there's benefits and challenges with both of these. You can use, when, when using a competitive solicitation, it may create more solution options, but, um, and, and they may be less costly. Um, internal utility estimates may be compiled more quickly than a solicitation would. Um, but could be less transparent and also could be more costly. And I have a little text box example of uh, what NYSEG did in New York. They had uh, an RFI, a request for information, which they used to inform their RFP. And then they received, uh, I think, 16 different responses, which they then aggregated to create their portfolio. So that was just a nice example I thought I'd share. We can go on to the next slide. The last part of the portfolio development is compiling the resources into a portfolio. And this is my amazing graphic of efficiency and demand response equaling cost savings. Um, and then verifying that the, the portfolio is going to meet the actual technical project needs. We can go on to the, the next slide. The third step in the framework is um, cost benefit cost analysis and just making sure that your portfolio meets the technical requirements and uh, is cost effective. Uh, just a few notes, electrification, it's, it's important to consider that carefully, especially if you're switching from gas to electric and considering the implications on your electricity system. Uh, the table on this slide is an illustrative example of that uh, up on the top. And then it's also worth noting that just because a non-pipeline alternative doesn't pass a benefit cost analysis doesn't mean that it's not cost effective, with the distinction being that um, the benefit cost analysis is really tied to the benefits and the costs that are included in the analysis, as well as the discount rate. And the cost effectiveness would could be considering the cost of the next least cost resource. So even though it may not have more benefits than it does cost, it might be cheaper than what the alternatives are. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, we, we talked about third-party criteria and more qualitative criteria when creating the portfolio evaluation. Um, it's important if you are going through a contractor to consider the risk associated with the contractor failure um, to ensure the reliability of the grid or of the gas system. And the table on the right side of this slide shows some criteria that the New York utilities have developed to evaluate proposals um, to ensure that there's accountability by contractors as well. We can go on to the next slide. I think this is the last portion of the framework and that's consideration of equity is, is something that can be included in a non-pipeline alternative analysis and um, Energy justice and equity is often described um, through four pillars, which is what's shown on the right side of the slide. And in our framework, we have a couple of different options that we highlight for how to incorporate equity into the analysis. One is through use of the distributional equity analysis framework that LBNL and Synops and E for the Future recently developed. I have a link to that there. Um, the other option is to add a preference for adder, which is a little bit more of a coarse way to incorporate the benefits or costs associated with the MPA and implications on equity. And it's really just adding um, a cost adder or a benefit into your cost effectiveness evaluation or benefit cost analysis, excuse me. We can go on to the next slide. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of different examples that um, states can take if they're interested in pursuing 
uh, MPAs. Uh, you can review your current natural gas planning requirements and see if there's an opportunity for increased transparency or coordination. Um, states can incorporate non-pipeline alternative analysis into the existing planning processes and uh, it can help PUCs and utilities and stakeholders comprehensively explain and understand what the planned investments are and the impacts on system conditions as well as the forecasts. Um, another option is incorporating equity and thinking about how equity can be brought into your MPA. Um, as I mentioned, that, that can be done through incorporating the distributional equity analysis guidance or through the preference adder. Um, you can review your benefits and costs to make sure that your benefits and costs are robustly being considered uh, in the analysis. And finally, uh, you can review um, your existing utility financial incentives to determine if there's an opportunity to further utilities' interests um, in MPAs through a financial mechanism. The next slide that I have is just some questions that states can ask as they are considering non-pipeline alternative analysis. And I won't go through those. Um, after this, I think I have a resource slide and then probably uh, a handful of slides that say nothing that I should have deleted. So we can we can go on to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Appreciate it. Very well done. Uh, we are going to moving moving on. Uh, I'm just going to call her Courtney because I am not going to hack up her last name. Courtney, if, <laughs> if you would go ahead and just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Courtney Eichhorst, and I'm a director in a, the regulatory strategy team for National Grid. Thank you for having me. The floor is yours. So um, I can, as I said, I'm at National Grid and I'm gonna share a little bit about National Grid's experience with NPAs, um, as well as a report that we co-authored with Rocky Mountain Institute on uh, evaluating NPAs uh, earlier this year. So to start, I'll just give a quick overview of National Grid service territory. So we are um, a utility in Massachusetts and New York and within the US and we serve more than 20 million people. And then I'll just go ahead and jump in. Uh, the presentation, if you can move to the next slide. So we have been thinking about non-pipeline alternatives for a few years. Um, we have an, uh, an MPA framework in place in New York, and we are currently developing one in Massachusetts. And we got together with Rocky Mountain Institute last year and started to think about um, really what, it, uh, what is the current state of NPAs across the country and around the world. And so we worked together to identify nine uh, case studies on NPAs and clean heat planning and gathered some insights that we wanted to share. So to start, I'm gonna cover three types of NPAs. And um, so uh, thank you, Natalie, for sort of setting us up level setting on some definitions of NPAs. And one thing we tried to do in this report, and I think you did this a little bit, Natalie, as well, is define some of the different types of NPAs and different considerations that you might have on, on solutions. Um, and relative challenges and opportunities for different types. So I'm gonna talk about three types. Um, the first type is avoided replacement NPAs. And so that is a case where you have a pipeline that needs to be replaced typically for safety, uh, reliability or integrity reasons. One example of this is leak prone pipe. Uh, in national grid service territory, we do have a lot of what we call leak prone pipe. That's a lot of cast iron and bare steel where the pipeline would have to be replaced. So in order to avoid that investment, you have to actually decommission the gas asset, which requires fully moving all customers on that pipeline away from gas. This of course requires, um, in today's paradigm, customer coordinated and voluntary customer adoption. And so the relative scale and size of the NPAs is a really big consideration in the feasibility and the likelihood of um, that NPA going through. So. This little graphic tries to illustrate that by showing that if you have a pipeline that's just serving one home, potentially in a rural area where you just have a single pipe uh, feeding one home, you only have to convince one customer to sign up and say yes. If you have a, a neighborhood, in the case where we have six homes off of one gas pipeline, you've got to convince all six of those households to voluntarily participate in the non-pipeline alternative in order to move those customers off gas and avoid, avoid the investment. The next type is uh, avoided capacity expansion. And to avoid a capacity upgrade, you just need to reduce gas demand. 
overall gas demand across usually a, a broader section uh, of customers. So you do not necessarily need to convert 100% of customers. And you can also deploy a portfolio of solutions, including energy efficiency, electrification, demand response, et cetera. And then the third type is avoided system extension or new connections or, or growth. So anytime that you have a developer coming in to request connections to a new neighborhood or a new building, this can be avoided by just redirecting that developer to a, a different solution, whether that's all, all electric, whether it's geothermal or air source heat pumps uh, or otherwise, that uh, you can avoid a new gas pipeline being built in that case. So those are, those are all sort of three types with relatively different levels of challenge and some different solutions. Um, and then I'll just touch on uh, some of the additional customer considerations on the next slide. Thanks. So this, this slide I think touches on some of the challenges of customer uh, coordinated and voluntary customer adoption that we would see with the avoided replacement NPAs. And so, as I mentioned, all of the customers on that segment we need to participate for an avoided replacement um, NPA to succeed. So in the first case here, an example segment A, you've got uh, all 10 customers agree and you can avoid the pipeline, decommission the asset. Um, but if one customer on that pipeline says no and they're the farthest from the feeder, then that means that that gas, gas pipeline investment cannot be avoided and the pipe stays in service. And so the, here, not only the coordination, but the location of the customers really matters. So there may be some circumstances in which you can get a, you know, more than one, but a, a sizable um, number of the customers to coordinate, but it just depends on where they fall on that pipeline segment. So if the, a group of customers can all agree and they're at the end of the, the segment, then you can retire at the end of the segment up to the last customer that does not wish to participate. So today we see customer uh, adoption and customer interest is one challenge that needs to be considered for NPAs to, to move forward and, and particularly for scale. Next slide, please. So we looked across the country and in Europe to see examples of NPAs and clean heat planning. And we found a few, few examples of what we found, I think, overall is that NPAs are still relatively early scale. We have seen some examples of, of success. PG&E, I think most notably, has had 88 successful NPAs at the time this report was published in May, and that was converting 105 customers. So the relative size, obviously, is quite small. So I think from PG&E's experience, they have not had success with more than five customers for any given NPA project. Um, I think from uh, shortly after the time the report was published, we found out about one NPA that has, I think, 10 customers. That is the largest NPA that I'm aware of, at least within the U.S. Um, in Europe, there is sort of larger, they're thinking more about the municipal scale of clean heat planning, where they are looking to move uh, more neighborhood scale projects away from gas and to do larger scale decommissioning. But in terms of the sort of segment segment level NPAs within the US and five to 10 is, is really the upper limit of what we've seen um, so far in terms of success. Um, we have had a couple of examples of NPAs in our upstate New York, in a, yeah, our upstate New York service territory. Um, we have had relatively small scale again, we've had three NPAs uh, serving three individual customers. And these are what we call farm taps. And that is where a customer is being served by uh, uh, an, an individual sort of transmission um, size pipe and a, a regulator station was avoided in those three scenarios. So those were scenarios where you only had to convince one customer at a time. Um, and so far we have had some challenges with some of our larger skill NPAs. But overall today in New York, we have, we have pursued about 30 NPAs overall and we've only had the, the three successful ones so far. Uh, in Europe, as I mentioned, they're doing more of the municipal scale clean heat planning. And so there are some countries where that is um, becoming more prevalent. So far, we know of one example in Switzerland where we have um, seen an example of neighborhood scale decommissioning. Um, so that's in Zurich. 
And that's the only example that has completed neighborhood scale decommissioning to date, but other cities um, in Switzerland and Netherlands are, are looking into those options as well. That's gonna be much uh, a much longer time horizon um, in terms of customer notification and the engagement that would need to occur than um, what we've seen so far in the US. Typically about 10 years of notice for customers. Next slide, please. So the, the case studies that we did with, with RMI, I think yielded some important insights that we wanted to share. So I think first of all, NPA projects today, they reflect diverse energy policy goals and energy system characteristics. So some of the examples that we saw from Europe, for example, were driven by geopolitical concerns in addition to environmental concerns. And projects within the US Different types of NPAs may depend on whether or not a company has a lot of leak from pipe, for example, or whether they have mostly new plastic pipe in their service territory, for example. The prioritization of NPA projects we think should weigh a broad set of criteria, and the report includes and exists of some of those examples, including gas asset risk and hydraulic feasibility, electric capacity, benefit cost criteria, and customer propensity and community factors. And so that really means the implications as a utility means that there's a lot of different people that will, will need to be involved when utilities are starting to think about NPAs. So gas engineers, electric engineers, regulatory teams, and customer teams are really all going to have to start working together to make these NPAs work. Um, another thing that we found was that community planning is really important. And so utility and municipality partnership, we think, may be a key element of NPA projects. And so I think the, to the extent that communities have environmental goals, and there may be higher just general propensity for adoption and interest in certain communities. That's something to consider. Of course, like equity and environmental justice is, is another important consideration that Natalie mentioned. And so I think that's something that utilities need to be thinking about is, um, as they're planning and evaluating these projects. Funding and cost allocation was another key issue that we considered. And so to date, we've seen that gas utilities and gas ratepayers have been typically the ones to fund these projects. But I think as we think about some of the relative costs and benefits for gas customers, uh, electric customers, and society at large, there, I think, are good reasons to consider socializing these costs more broadly between electric and gas ratepayers, as well as looking for alternative funding sources, such as taxpayer, federal, state, or local taxpayer funding, to help mitigate some bill pressure, you know, potential bill pressures, depending on scale. Um, I mentioned the some of the customer adoption challenges a couple of times that I think as we think about the relative scale that we've seen to date and the challenges of the coordinated customer adoption that we've seen so far, it seems that individual customer persuasion to reach 100% participation is likely not a scalable approach, at least for avoided replacement projects. Um, and then if utilities, if states want to scale NPAs, then policy change will likely be needed to evolve the utility business model and help to overcome some of those customer barriers. Next slide, please. So National Grids Path, we've, we've been spending lots of time uh, evaluating some of the NPAs that we've done to date in New York, um, taking back lessons learned, and our path forward includes uh, a couple of things. One, continued target el targeted electrification pilots. So we are incorporating learnings to date and working to test improved customer community education and outreach. Um, stakeholder engagement is really important and that's something that we're thinking about um, as part of integrated energy planning more holistically. I know that topic I think was addressed a couple of weeks ago, but I think we think about NPAs as sort of underneath the integrated energy planning umbrella. And so I think it's something that we see as important to engage on with stakeholders and communities um, that are interested in um, electrification. And we can sort, certainly think about partnering with communities as we think about scaling and sort of targeting certain areas, particularly where we might have concentrations of leak prone pipe, for example. Cross-utility collaboration is also really important. Um, I know we've just flashed up National Grid Service Territory at the beginning of the call, but if you, you may have noticed from the map that we have relatively limited overlap between our gas and electric service territories, and that's quite common 
I think, across utilities. And so working with pure utilities is going to be critical in areas where we do not have electric and gas overlap. Um, and new tools and capabilities is, is something that we're thinking about. We have talked to several peer utilities and we have found that there is no clear tool that can really do this NPA analysis and the types of analysis that I think we need for integrated energy planning uh, at large. And so we are working on exploring and testing some new software tools to help facilitate um, the scale, you know, scaling some of this analysis. Next slide, please. And then I'll, I'll quickly try to run through, I think, some of the current state of play in Massachusetts and New York. So in Massachusetts, we received the Future of Gas or 2080 order late last year, where we are now required to do a, a gas prudency review. And so what that means is we have to evaluate all future gas investments for NPA viability and cost effectiveness um, as of December 2023. We're currently in the midst of developing an NPA framework with stakeholders, and so that I think will further define you know, exactly the pro what the process is, the benefit cost analysis, et cetera. And at the same time, we're also working on a targeted electrification filing in Massachusetts. Um, and there's also an electric sector modernization plan order that came out recently that also addresses the topic of integrated energy planning and emphasizes the importance of coordination between gas and electric utilities. And then in New York, we recently concluded a rate case. I feel just jump to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we recently concluded our rate case in downstate New York, and that joint proposal contains specific and actionable commitments uh, related to, to promote MPAs, and our upstate New York filing builds upon those. So just a couple of things I'll highlight. Standard planning um, is also um, something that came out of that in New York. So NPA evaluations will all be incorporated as part of standard capital planning process before proceeding with new uh, or replacement infrastructure. Um, expanded projects, so it also expands the types of projects where NPAs will be considered. There are also lots of explicit considerations for leak prone pipe in particular, some of which seek to try to align the timeline and the risk prioritization of leak prone pipe with the process of identifying potential alternatives. Um, I'll also note that equity has been added as a consideration. So we're specifically um, required to prioritize projects in disadvantaged communities and also to work with the New York City Housing Authority to develop a large scale NPA. And there's also some uh, provisions in there for improving outreach and uh, education and stakeholder engagement. So that concludes my presentation and I'll pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Courtney. Well done. Appreciate you. Um, and I might might not have reminded if, if our speakers would stick around, as we do have a Q and A coming up after uh, the next presentation. And with that, Josh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, I'm Josh Bigger. I'm a senior associate at the Brattle Group and um, co-lead our gas utility practice. And um, I'm going to be talking today about. Uh, benefit cost analyses for MPA programs and, um, you know, some of our, our, the work that we've done in this area and you know, the best practices that, that we've seen in the um, BCA frameworks that exist so far for MPA programs. Um, so as, as Natalie teed up nicely, you know, benefit cost analyses are a systematic way of, you know, identifying and quantifying what those um, expected benefit costs are of an investment. Um, and by looking um, at a broad set of those benefits and, and costs, um, we can figure out what, what options would maximize the benefits of a particular um, investment decision. And this differs a little bit from uh, least cost tests, which are a little bit more narrow focused on looking at just you know present values of revenues versus cost and seeing if one is greater than the other. Um, BCAs are more broad, they inc incorporate a lot of other different uh, benefits beyond just revenues and costs, which makes them um, a very handy framework for evaluating uh, non-pipeline alternatives. Um, and as you think about, BCA analyses, there's a couple of, you know, high level fundamental questions um, when designing it, such as, you know, what is the desired outcome? Um, and that'll help define what are those 
universe of benefits and costs that you're going to measure as part of this um, program. And then from what perspective are you measuring those programs? Is it from the utilities perspective or society's perspective? Um, again, kind of informing how you measure those things. Um, and then non-pipeline alternatives, this kind of the name implies is, you know, um, considering some, you know, but for alternative, you're, you know, pursuing an NPA investment in lieu of doing something else. And again, that will have to be measured as part of, you know, the BCA analysis. And then the relevant time frame over which those investments take, take place. And so um, it provides kind of a broad framework, um, different than, you know, traditional least cost test um, analyses. And so, you know, as Natalie mentioned, there's, you know, part of thinking about PCA analyses is what is the policy purpose? And um, I always think it's kind of a good reminder to think about the evolution of non-pipeline alternatives. Um, you know, they were originally started back in 2017 um, when Con Edison was exploring um, energy efficiency, demand management, and other NPA programs to, you um, identify or to address the reliability need. They were, um, their load growth was increasing quite a bit and there was difficulty in building a new interstate transmission system to the area in order to meet that growing demand. And so non-pipeline alternatives was the solution to it to um, address that uh, reliability need. So kind of the non-pipeline aspect of it in the name is, you know, referring to this interstate pipeline. Um, so this, you know, took place in 2017 and uh, the Con Ed worked with the PSD and stakeholders to develop that BCA framework for non-pipeline alternatives. And it was based on work that um, the company had done prior with this non-wire solutions program, which had a similar aim of, um, avoiding the need to build a, a substation that was going to cost like about a, a billion dollars. So since that time, uh, climate and energy policy goals have been put in place and it kind of shifted the focus of non-pipeline alternatives from probably a more reliability focused program to a more uh, decarbonization focused um, program. And um, since that other states have adopted it kind of for that um, similar purpose. So with that like framing in mind and thinking about different ways that MPAs can be evaluated um, or can be deployed, um, that'll inform how you, you know, a BCA framework might look. Um, and I'll go over into this a little bit more detail, but at least at a high level, um, you know, you're establishing the program scale. What do you, you know, what are the non-pipeline alternatives um, going to be deployed um, to address? Uh, then you're going to start measuring, you know, what are the different benefit and cost streams that are relevant when addressing that identified need. And then digging deeper is, you know, what is the system impact on, you know, of a particular MPA technology um, if it were to de be deployed by the gas utility. And then figuring out what is the value of, of that system impact and then doing that process over again for each of the different benefit and cost analyses um, streams to be able to do that calculation of the ratio of benefits and, and cost. So, um, you know, the first step is, you know, what is the scope of the MPA program? And it'll depend on what the desired outcome is. Is it reducing emissions? Is it addressing a reliability need? Um, reducing cost by deferring or avoiding gas um, investments or perhaps some other type of um, outcome. And, um, you know, with that identified, you know kind of what your but for is. So what do you, what what are the costs um, or, or system implications are you avoiding by pursuing this particular MPA? With that goal and outcome defined, I think then that um, allows you to kind of shape the BCA framework to think about what technologies um, would be permitted under this framework. Um, many of the existing NPA frame, uh, frameworks are technology agnostic and, you know, kind of consider a whole, um, a whole host of different technologies, like the ones that are on the, on the table on the right. Um, but, you know, you can also have a more technology specific 
um, BCA framework where, you know, if your goal is decarbonization, you might focus on, you know, for example, a narrower set of um, demand side technologies. And so then with the um, policy goal and objectives defined, you know, is, um, then that can allow you to think about what is the cost effectiveness test. And the cost effectiveness test um, is something that's been used in evaluating energy efficiency and demand response programs and has been, you know, adapted to non-pipeline alternatives, but it essentially refers to what is the universe of benefit and cost that you're going to consider as part of the MPA um, framework. Um, most of the BCA frameworks that are out there um, rely on what's called the societal cost test. And um, that is the broadest cost effectiveness test um, score because it reflects, you know, what are the direct benefits and costs, but also what are the costs of the externalities, such as the cost of emissions, um, and some other non-standard benefits like reliability, resiliency, um, equity, things like that. Um, but, you know, it, you know, if you choose uh, one particular cost effectiveness, you know, sometimes you can also look at a, another cost effectiveness test as well alongside it to help kind of inform, you know, that decision. So maybe looking at what are the ratepayer impacts or, um, you know, what are the um, impact to the utilities costs, for example. So with that um, specific cost effectiveness defined, you know, there's certain benefit and cost streams that fall under it. And here, this is just kind of an illustrative example from um, an electrification project. And so um, on the cost, you're going to be thinking about what is the uh, cost for the utility, the budget for the utility to implement this program? Um, what are the equipment costs? things like that. And then there's a whole host of different benefits that, you know, may or may not be evaluated as part of the BCA, you know, depending on whether it's relevant to the particular um, NPA that's being evaluated and whether it has a material impact. But some of these can be, you know, avoided fuel costs, GHG emissions, air pollutants, methane leaks, um, maintenance costs, and gas infrastructure costs. But it's also important to be symmetrical when measuring these benefits and costs and consider the implications on um, uh, other energy systems as well. So if you're switching from gas to electric, what about the increased generation costs, uh, generation capacity, TNT capacity, um, power sector emissions, uh, rec costs if they're applicable? And then um, the under the SCT, there's other non-standard benefits that are, you know, listed here on the right, um, which, you know, are admittedly a little bit harder to quantify and measure, um, but they can be considered as long as, you know, if they're present and real, they might factor into that ultimate determination of whether or not um, a particular MPA passes the BCA test. And yeah, so depending on which MPA technology is being considered, um, different sets of benefits and costs can be um, considered. And, you know, I have a couple of examples here for, you know, energy efficiency, electrification, and on-system compressed natural gas um, storage facility. Um, but once, the, you know, the particular benefits and costs have been identified, then, um, you know, you, the next step is to value what those are. And when valuing what the system impacts are of the non-pipeline alternative, it's the marginal cost that's most important. And I think this is where um, MPA BCA frameworks get quite interesting is because um, those marginal costs you know, should be as specific to the MPA um, being evaluated as possible, which, um, you know, the utility may or may not have those um, cost estimates and or developed, and so additional analyses might be needed. So, for example, um, if you're deploying an electrification project in one particular um, neighborhood, you would want to try and identify what the marginal impacts are on, you know, the distribution system, 
um, as opposed to, you know, maybe a broader marginal cost number that includes the transmission and regulator system. Uh, similarly, if, um, uh, if that project is in a particular subpart of the utility service territory, the marginal cost might be different there than perhaps another geographic location on that system. And so the extent that you can use as granular as possible marginal cost, then that's kind of the, you know, the best possibility for measuring these, um, the benefits and costs of the, the MPAs. Timing is another one, um, you know, if this MPA is having an impact on peak demand for the gas utility, that's going to have certain impact relative to something that's reducing demand over the course of the entire year. And you might um, consider uh, what costs are being avoided, perhaps like peaking supplies or other delivered services that are used by gas utilities on that coldest day. Um, and then equivalently, what, what's going on on the electric system um, at that time as well. Um, some states have started to develop guidance on how these different benefits and cost streams um, should be measured, but um, I think there's a lot of work going on on you know, trying to define um, the best practices for measuring each of these different benefit and cost streams. Um, but you know, as part of that, the you know, these BCA frameworks and handbooks should be a living document and updated frequently, you know, to um, reflect what are the updated um, utility data, for example, you know, maybe the marginal cost of serving a customer in a particular area evolves over time as there's success with MPA programs or other initiatives um, or um, other inputs like um, cost of emissions or other things like that um, change over time as well. So. Uh, BCA framework are something that needs to be maintained on a on a regular basis. Uh, just quickly, kind of bringing it all together, um, you know, measuring the benefits and costs as you know participation estimates times the system impact uh, times the value of the system impact, um, and then discounting those. And the discount rate can be, um, you know, it's traditionally the utility WAC. Um, but you may consider other types of discount rates depending on, you know, the perspective and the policy goals of the analysis, such as the societal discount rate. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, generally, but if the benefit cost ratio is greater than one, then it passes the test. But if, um, if the MPA falls a little bit short of that, you may consider other non-energy benefits like reliability or um, health impacts or something like that, as long as they're present and real and recognize that, you know, there is true benefit there, that might um, kind of tip the evaluation one way or the other. Um, and just, you know, my last slide here, just some uh, takeaways. Um, the scope of the and perspective of the MPA program matters, you know, whether it's being um, used to address the reliability need or um, mission reduction or cost savings that can inform um, the breadth and scope of, of the BCA framework. Um, the societal cost test is the most commonly used metric in MPA evaluation because it considers that broad aspect, uh, a spectrum of benefits. Uh, the marginal cost um, used in the BCA framework should be um, up to date and as specific as possible to the MPA being evaluated, which may require utilities um, undertaking additional analyses to, to define those numbers. Um, and then they should, you know, the framework should regularly kind of be reviewed to um, capture the industry best practices of how these different benefits and costs um, streams are being evaluated. So I think with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Commissioner Johnson. All righty, thank you, Joshua. I appreciate that very much. Well done. Um, you believe uh, now we're gonna uh, head into our Q&A and I believe at this point we are going to stop the recording.